Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like or subscribe to Cleaning Up. It really helps other people to find us. Cleaning Up is brought to you by the Liebreich Foundation and the Gilardini Foundation. I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is James Thornton, founder and CEO of Client Earth. He uses the power of the law to hold governments and corporations to account over air quality, climate change, and other environmental issues. Please welcome James Thornton. So James, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to have you uh, on the show here today. Tell me, um, what are you working on at the moment? Give us the short version of what's keeping you busy right now. Well, Michael, I mean, it's a big world out there and there are a lot of environmental problems, right? So um, what I'm spending my time on as the, as the CEO of Client Earth is <clears throat> taking uh, our organization uh, global. So I started it in uh, Europe uh, in 2008 and uh, it's now grown to uh, 260 people, uh, uh, about 170 of them lawyers. And we've got offices in London and uh, Madrid, Brussels, Berlin, Warsaw, Beijing, and this week uh, we open in Singapore and very soon in Los Angeles. So uh, I'm spending my time on making sure we have a coherent global program on climate change uh, and uh, protecting nature and people. Uh, and then of course I do what the CEO of any charity does, which is, uh, I spend a lot of time fundraising. <laughs> Right. Well, I was going to say, if that was what you're doing this week, and it was like, well, you know, that probably takes you until about Tuesday evening. So what do you do the rest of the week? But that's a big agenda. And of course, on fundraising, the um, the fun fact that not everybody um, listening or watching this will know is that you are funded at the moment by um, David Gilmore's guitars, the fantastic sale of his guitars, correct? He is, um, he and his wife are amazingly generous people. And uh, so they uh, decided that they were going to sell his guitar collection uh, about two years ago. Uh, and very big collection, uh, 120 some guitars, a uh, lifetime of uh, guitars, really. And, and this uh, is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd, for those who haven't. Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, Pink, Mr. Pink, Mr. Pink Floyd, the, the great guitarist. And, um, uh, and they decided to make it a charity auction. <clears throat> and they're particularly interested in helping to reduce climate change. So they took the guitars to Christie's and um, Christie's uh, thought the collection was going to be worth about a million or a million and a half. Uh, and David did a little video uh, which went viral. Um, and he said, you know, we're selling these guitars to fund the fight against climate change. The best organization in the world, highest leverage to do that in our view is Client Earth please come to the auction. Uh, and why? Why should you come? It's the most important problem of our time. Let me put it this way. We need to make sure that we have a future in which guitars can be played and songs can be sung. And it's a beautiful way of capturing the future that we would like to see. Yeah. It, uh, it really is, and narratives matter. And in fact, the funny thing is that we're on about, I think this is episode 45 and, um, and it's the second time that uh, David Gilmore has been involved in some way, because episode 11 was a guy called John D. And John D. organized, he's a great environmentalist and a broadcaster and an in incredible guy involved in all sorts of things. He's protected mm. more trees than, 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 than you could imagine. Um, but he also organized the um, Rock Aid Armenia concert okay. and uh, and uh, single they did smoke on the water and so on and david gilmore played on that as well so uh quite incredible just in 44 episodes he's already cropped up twice or 45 well, very very generous uh, very smart very generous and uh, he and polly as i say decided that the money was going to go to climate change and then to climate earth and because he made that a video and it went viral uh, christie's estimate turned out to be way wrong uh, the guitar sold for 21 million uh and, uh, and uh, after Christie's took its whack, uh, he donated, uh, they donated the rest of it to Client Earth. And that is amazingly generous. It's the kind of gift that universities get, but not a relatively small environmental groups. Mm -hmm. Well, and so let's talk about the model of your environmental yep. group, because it's very specific. I mean, you already mm -hmm. said it, you've got 170 lawyers. And um, uh, so what is your theory of environmental action because it's not getting 
hundreds of thousands of people out marching on the streets or, you know, but, but so what is it exactly that client earth does and what were the seeds of it? Yeah, well, what's different about it is that it's, it's a group of lawyers. And uh, the idea is that uh, law is an astonishingly powerful tool. Uh, it allows you, if you know how to use it creatively, to write the rules of the game. So uh, <clears throat> if you're working in the parliament in Brussels or London or indeed in Congress, uh, if you can get anything through Congress these days, um, what do you do uh, by writing legislation, helping to write legislation, is move the rules of the game uh, in the direction that you want them to go. And then uh, you can uh, enforce the law. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about some examples where uh, we sued the UK government successfully or we sued companies successfully uh, and make them do what the law says uh, because both governments and companies often like to, uh, to forget what it says, particularly when it comes to the environment, if, if no one's watching. So it's a very powerful, powerful tool. And, um, you know, uh, I don't say that you use it uh, as opposed to other methods. <clears throat> the way I see it is uh, people marching on the streets, uh, people working in corporations for environmental change, people working in journalism for environmental change, uh, whatever it may, the kids are going on strike uh, on Fridays, all of these are agents of environmental change. But when you add law to uh, the campaigning and so on, it adds enormous power. It potentiates uh, all of that power. And uh, in Europe, uh, until we started doing this, there were very few lawyers working on uh, environmental law. And what it meant is that civil society uh, uh, about the environment was really a highly underrepresented group. So governments and companies have very sophisticated uh, lawyers working for them. Uh, but people and the, the environment didn't. And that's the big gap. It was the missing piece that, that, uh, we, that we filled. Where did it come from? Well, I started doing this work in the 1970s in the United States. And there, uh, there was a civil rights movement that was quite powerful because there was apartheid. Uh, and lawyers got involved because if you were a person of color and asserted your rights, you would be arrested, thrown in jail. So lawyers got uh, involved to get people out of jail and then more and more they became embedded in the civil rights movement and they started to take a strategic role <clears throat> and then to see, ah, we can write the laws. So the Civil Rights Act, uh, we can bring strategic big cases, which they did. And those skills that were developed there then got carried over into the environmental movement, uh, which was born some years after the civil rights movement in the USA. But since there was no apartheid in Europe, there was no need for a civil rights movement in the same way. And therefore the environmental movement didn't have that precedent in the EU and went in the direction of campaigning. So my thought was we could add it uh, and uh, you know add it like yeast and bake a better loaf of bread. And that's that's what uh, seems to uh, be happening. That is so fascinating um, because you can actually expand from that story and you can draw a thread. And, I, and if there's a if somebody has done this in a book, I would absolutely love to uh, to to know about it and to read it. But you can actually draw a thread from the abolitionists uh, in the UK, slavery abolitionists, through to the women's suffrage movement, through to uh, the human rights movement uh, in the US, through mm -hmm. to LBGT rights, and yep. now through to environment. The techniques from the fundraising to the use of uh, marches and, uh, and civic society, through to uh, direct action, uh, you know, civil disobedience, through to uh, the piece that you're talking about and that you've dedicated your career to, the use of law, you can actually draw a thread right through those, can't you? Well, that's right. And each of them learns uh, from the other, you know, and, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a, a gal in the uh, uh, women's rights movement in America was talking a couple of years ago saying, wow, the gays have been so successful in the last couple of years. We really need to study the techniques. And I said, smart idea. Absolutely. Let's learn every one of us from the other one. And that's how the techniques evolve. Right, and so this approach of using lawyers, when I started New Energy Finance, because my career before then was really nothing to do with, you know, sort of environment, the whole kind of um, environment, but also justice environment was not what I came from. I was an, you know, an engineer and a business person, but early years of New Energy Finance, I became aware of, particularly in the US, um, the NRDC, that, that had lawyers and was doing this. And that's where you started, was it not? Yes, so I started uh, at uh, NRDC in 1979, actually. So 
it was about uh, eight and a half years old then, uh, still quite a small organization. And then uh, I started a, um, a project there as in my 20s in the New York office where Ronald Reagan had stopped enforcing the environmental laws. Uh, and that was a decision. They were just not going to enforce and they were going to let uh, companies know. Uh, so they did and the company stopped complying. And I started a project where the question was, could a tiny group of people, so it was essentially me, a chemist and an assistant, uh, could we enforce a law? So we picked the Clean Water Act, a very important uh, law. And we brought the cases the Justice Department should have been bringing uh, and uh, we won them all. I started with 60 cases at once. Uh, and eventually we embarrassed the government, the federal government uh, into doing its job again. Uh, and that, then I went to LA and set up uh, the Los Angeles office of the NRDC. But NRDC is one of the couple of places in the US where the, these techniques were first developed. Uh, and then by coming to Europe, interestingly, they changed. You were talking about the evolution of the techniques. Now, the basic core of using law to protect people's health and the environment remains the same. But because the social context is quite different, uh, some of the uh, techniques need to evolve. So the US is essentially one big legal system. Uh, and I got to the e EU. I mean, obviously the EU uh, was, well, uh, the UK was part of it. So it was 28 countries plus an EU system, 29 systems. Um, so if you wanted to work, you had to be skillful about moving from system to system and looking for leverage uh, in EU law, but then also at the member state level. And what that meant was that um, I had to become uh, adept at developing partnerships uh, with organizations in countries where I had no office, uh, but there was an important job to do, uh, stop a coal-fired power station, clean up the air, save a forest, and so on. So uh, what's developed in our repertoire then is also this very um, uh, central part of the way we work is to is to work with other organizations. And we have uh, memorandums of understanding with about 200 uh, other NGOs uh, at the moment and that we have partnerships with. And indeed we have um, a memorandum of understanding with the uh, uh, Supreme Court of China and the Federal Prosecutors of China and the Ministry of Environment of China. So these partnerships uh, can be varied and uh, allow you to go into places that you couldn't be otherwise in. and find ways working in partnership to exert leverage. You know. Okay, so let's come back to China because that's, yeah. um, uh, that's very interesting, very specific though. And you already said that you've got these uh, partnerships and some people will be going, well, hang on a second, aren't you supposed to be holding the those sorts of players to account? Hmm. But before we do that, let's talk about some of the stuff, the most famous uh, case in the UK at least. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll come back to China uh, later in the session. Um, so in the UK, your great win was on air quality, was it not? So t talk, talk yes. us about so, yes. so here's, here's how that happened. Uh, you know, so I, I was starting up in 2008, um, and uh, no one had done this type of work for the environment using law systematically uh, in the EU. So I had to demonstrate first principles. So um, first of all, I had to learn EU law and become a solicitor in the UK as well. Those I did along the way, you know. And then, then you... Um, say, okay, can citizens actually enforce the law? Will that work You know, uh, within, within Europe? No one's done that. Uh, how do I make that work? Uh, so I, first of all, I found a law that I thought would be enforceable, <clears throat> which is the, the clean air law that applies to all the countries because it had uh, standards for what the pollution level should be, you know, numerical standards. And it had a timetable by which governments had to make the air meet those standards. So I thought, well, this looks pretty enforceable. Uh, and then the issue had to be one <clears throat> that was uh, <clears throat> really important. Uh, so not just a theoretical type of issue, but, uh, and I was amazed that uh, the air was so bad in Europe, uh, largely due to diesel cars and other vehicles. It was much cleaner in the, in the US because petrol rather than diesel. So here we had an issue that was affecting the lives of 400,000 or more people in the EU who were dying early of air pollution every year, an enormous number of people. Uh, so issue of great moment, affecting human health and the environment, looks like I can enforce it. So we, we brought a case, uh, and indeed, uh, we, beat, we started in the UK, beat the UK government, um, and uh, then we had to go all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the UK government uh, was, uh, was being quite difficult about it. So uh, in 2010, 
they had to meet the standards for uh, you know two toxic poison gas and they didn't so we sued but before we sued we wrote this nice letter because i had uh, in addition to being a member of the bar in the US, I'd become a solicitor in the UK. And I learned that in the UK, you write a nice letter before you sue somebody. So I wrote a very nice letter and uh, uh, said, uh, well, uh, to the government saying, surely you know that the law requires you to meet these standards. And no doubt you have a plan uh, to meet them uh, by the right date. So please tell us what that plan is. Otherwise, we'll have to see you. So they, they wrote back, uh, and it was an amazing letter. They said, uh, well, you're right about the, the data. You know, you're using our own data, and you're right, all these people are dying. It was 60,000 in the UK early every year. Uh, you know, you're right about that. But we have no intention of complying till at least 15 years from now, uh, because it's not convenient. And they took that position all the way up through the Supreme Court. Uh, and in the Supreme Court, they actually went so far as to say to the Supreme Court, um, you know, you, the Supreme Court, may not order us to comply with the law, which is a remarkable thing. Uh, so here we had the government saying that uh, in, the, in the Supreme Court, and uh, one of the judges uh, in the court uh, turned to us and said, well, uh, you've heard what the government has to say. Um, what do you expect us to do? We are only the Supreme Court. Um, so uh, it's, it's a wonderful question. And so obviously, it's their job. And we said to them roughly, uh, look, if you let the government walk into court today and say you can't order them to comply with the law, you know, this isn't just about environmental law. This is about all law, you know, uh, it's you know, family law, military law, commercial law. It doesn't matter. If they can walk in and say to the Supreme Court, we're only going to comply when it's convenient for us, you're no longer a democracy under the rule of law. It's a government by a fiat and dictum. And the Supreme Court very nicely then gave us an injunction and required the uh, government to come into compliance with the law. Now, they've been slow. We've had to go back twice and enforce the injunction twice. But uh, in London now, uh, there are plans, good plans, and uh, plans being developed all over the UK. Uh, and they never would have been developed uh, and the air would never have come into compliance. Uh, because when, uh, when a, a government says, we're not even gonna start looking at it until 15 years from now, that means you know two generations or, of politicians later. I can confirm to you that um, those plans would never have been brought forward and never been uh, actualized because I was uh, on the board of Transport for London. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, um, and I got on the board in 2012. So I was sort of watching what you were doing. Um, as I say, very familiar with you know the use of law in the US, skeptical about it in, the, in Europe and in the UK, but watching. And actually, I was active on air quality issues with the great uh, Simon Burkett. Yes. Uh, I, I, you know, acknowledged that. He was very kind, gave me a little award for, because what I did is I had a, I held a hackathon for um, clean air solutions and particularly around data. So I was pushing, using what little influence I had at the time to get uh, air quality data into the public domain, because my theory of action is, once you provide information, people tend to act on it. It becomes much yeah. harder to ignore once you spread information widely. So I was busy trying to sort of spread information and, um, and you were taking it and weaponizing it in the uh, courts. But I can assure you that when I got onto the board of Transport for London, there was great consternation and worry because of course it was um, London buses and London taxis that would have extra costs if they had to comply that was one of the big sources of the nitro of the uh, the NOx um, that you were uh, uh, that you pointed out was that was causing the trouble was that was the pollutant, and um, I don't know what what proportion comes from buses and taxis, but you know uh, TfL is also the regulator of uh, of all sorts of other activities, the traffic light system, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, and we were very worried about how much it might cost, and there was this sort of negotiations going on behind the scenes about well would that hit London's budget, or you know if the government said don't we're not going to do anything and we then planned accordingly who would actually end up having to pick up the tab if that mm -hmm. if that damn James Thornton wins what are we going to do well it's fascinating I, I of course didn't know anything about that uh, but uh, that's uh, it's really interesting um, right. and you have then London doing quite well uh, you know in, in its plans and you know bringing in clean air zones uh, and it's becoming a model and then all of the taxis the new taxis are being required to be uh, uh, electric so uh, that's a marvelous thing
In, indeed, and um, I mean, sadly, I can't claim to have pushed through the electric taxis. That was actually, um, all of that was put in place uh, prior to my joining the board. In fact, it's quite, you know, it, 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 the, 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 the wheels were set in motion uh, actually by Isabel Dedring, uh, who was the deputy mayor at that time mm -hmm. uh, under Boris. The buses, I'm very disappointed with how slow it, we've been to get electric buses. I'll be honest. I was pushing much, much harder. And there was a complete, I, I shouldn't use the words in this, con in this company, but there was a complete smoke screen about, oh no, you know, it, it will, Euro 6, Euro 5 will be fine, then Euro 6 will be fine. And then of course, oh, we mustn't do anything because there might be hydrogen buses. We had some experiment going on in East London. I mean, it was just, and, and there was a consistent effort to do nothing on buses, which is very, fr very frustrating, uh, right. to be quite honest. We should be much further along with electric yeah. buses already. Well, and I mean, Boris decided the Boris buses uh, to buy, uh, you know, diesel buses. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and also went. a disappointing decision. Yeah. yeah very good. Before my time. But as I say, you know, as soon as I arrived, I started to say, look, the solution is electric buses and that will really make a big difference. And it's very mm -hmm. slow, still very slow. And in fact, I don't think that we're uh, right now. The plan is to have the last diesel bus in London uh, removed in 2038. Mm. So, um, Newly re-elected Mayor Sadiq uh, talks about London being net zero by 2030, but actually the bit he controls, which is the buses, he's got no plan until 2038. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, I didn't know that, yeah. Oh, well. Uh, well, and then the interesting... The inter uh, you still uh, have work to do, James. You still have work to do. Well, there's, there's a lot of work to do. Well, right after that case, to show you how you can use law strategically and leapfrog from one thing to the other, um, we hoped to get... Uh, the, uh, the UK case up to the European Court of Justice, uh, which uh, it did go because the uh, Supreme Court of the UK uh, booted it up to the uh, European Court to say, what sort of remedy do we have to give? Because no one had ever, no court had ever uh, been required to give remedy. And the European Court very nicely said, uh, uh, essentially you have to, every nation's Supreme Court has to be willing to give uh, really serious uh, penalties or uh, injunctions to enforce this law. So this, didn't this revolve around the question of coming into compliance as quickly as possible or yes, words to effect? Right. And then the question right. is, is that as quickly as technologically possible or budgetarily possible mm. or in human yes. organization terms? Or what does it mean? Is that? You know, yes. Well, and in this law, interestingly, the uh, I mean, the law itself <clears throat> takes budget out of it. Uh, the Treasury refused to take budget out of it. And uh, with some of the papers that we uh, showed to the court uh, in enforcing the injunction, show the treasury was getting in the way and slowing things down. But what the law says, uh, that particular law, um, is somewhat unusual in saying that there are, <clears throat> there are these health standards to protect human health, otherwise people die, uh, and therefore the treasury can't make financial excuses. They just have to do it. Now, uh, it didn't make excuses, it, it, it sort of slowed things down. But um, uh, anyway, so we got up to the European court and then uh, we won there. And then we immediately went to Germany, um, the home of the diesel motor industry, and we brought cases in Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, uh, Munich, uh, and the, the home of you know, BMW, uh, Mercedes, Porsche, Volkswagen, and we won all of those cases. And the judges there uh, were more um, activist, really. Uh, and, and what they did is they issued bans for diesel vehicles in the center of those cities, which really drove the German motor industry nuts. So the cases went up to the Supreme Court of Germany. We won there. Angela Merkel, uh, who's generally really quite good, uh, but mm, German motor industry powerful. So she got on the television and said, well, this case about diesel cars, it's not really that big a deal. And we thought, wow, if the chancellor is saying it's not that big a deal, it's even bigger than we think it is. So, um, so that was very effective. And then within the next mm, 12 to 20 months, something like that, um, the, uh, there was a, a tanking in the uh, number of people in the market who bought diesel vehicles in Germany. Um, and there's a, it was about 22% less, something like that. Uh, and uh, that Green Fleet magazine, a magazine you probably don't read, but is, a, is an industry periodical for, uh, for people who want to uh, make fleets electric. Uh, and they, they uh, choose the, the 10 people a year who uh, have been most effective in driving fleets towards being green. Uh, and I was very, very pleased that year. Uh, I was uh, I was number six, and Elon Musk was number eight. And that's the only time I'm ever going to beat Elon Musk in anything. But it was but it was a lot of fun. 
Uh, and indeed, so what you see there is another extension. Uh, you've shown then that citizens can force the law, uh, that it can have a health impact, <clears throat> and also that it can have a market impact, um, driving uh, people away from dirtier to cleaner things, which then leads to the big project of trying to electrify uh, the culture and making a transition away from fossil fuels. So therefore uh, a big climate impact. I mean, I, uh, some of our advisors, a physicist, for example, says that uh, he thinks that all of these cases, and we've now done these cases in 20 countries in the EU, uh, will be responsible for moving people away from uh, fossil fuel vehicles probably about five years earlier in the end than, than would have happened, you know, because once you start winning these cases, the handwriting is on the wall for for diesel vehicles. And uh, it was in, in an interesting way, it also helped uh, the German motor industry because they were very slow to get onto electrics. They were making money on diesel engines and they were just kind of keep pushing that as far as they could. Meanwhile, uh, the Chinese were pushing as hard as they could on uh, making electric cars and they were getting uh, further and further ahead. So by forcing the Germans to switch their attention, we've actually, uh, um, without quite thinking about it originally, helped the, the German motor industry to not be beaten by, by the foreign competition. Yeah, and I think it, it is quite extraordinary how quickly things are moving. Because I remember yeah. when you won uh, those cases, and particularly the one in Stuttgart, because um, when I was a student, I put myself through university working in the factory for, for oh. Daimler, one of the Daimler factories. And Stuttgart is Daimler town. The, there's a huge Daimler star on one of the buildings, and that's the kind of, the, that is the landmark. And the idea that anything made by Daimler would be banned from Stuttgart city center. I mean, this was just, it can't have been more shocking. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you know, I and, and in terms of accelerating that transformation, it certainly um, was easier, even from my time on the board of transport for London, it was easier to engage with senior people who were, you know, ill-informed about climate, much easier to engage on, on uh, air quality issues Yes. directly on climate issues there wasn't a, there's no question of that well that was actually also one of one of the one of the thoughts behind doing that which was that uh climate um in 2008 was less talked about than it is now um and it's intellectually harder to grasp for anybody you know it's uh, it's a harder issue whereas if you could talk about um you know this hurts kids you know uh and um and it really does and then uh, the there was a lot of medical research that had been done, but a lot more was done after those cases, showing the terrible health impacts on kids of, uh, uh, of their lungs not growing uh, yeah. to full size and all that. And, you know, it became a relatable human problem, uh, something that uh, even though it was a, an invisible gas, but you knew you were breathing it and the kids were breathing it. And um, what was great is that then uh, par <clears throat> parents groups started all over the country and all of the environmental and health organizations, which had not had it as an issue, uh, picked it up as an issue. So that suddenly all across society, people were demanding this change. And to me, it was a very good example of what can uh, be potentiated by a, uh, a successful and uh, lucky in a way, uh, how much attention it got lawsuit or a series of lawsuits. And uh, that that could be an example for then what happens with climate change. It's a matter of, people taking it into consciousness and realizing that if they start demanding change, um, change will happen. It is also important to, for those watching or listening now to remember that going back to 2008, that was not obvious. I mean, now uh, it is obvious that air quality in cities is a huge issue, but even just a few years ago, um, I had a conversation with somebody about the third runway, uh, the Heathrow third runway, a business person. And I said, well, what's your plan for air quality? And after lots of toing and froing, it became clear that he simply didn't believe that there was an air quality issue. And that right. was only two, three years ago. And of course, we've just had um, the tragic find the coroner's finding in the UK, um, the, um, the, the little girl, uh, Kisi Debra, uh, um, Ella, um, Ella and Kisi Debra, this little girl who's, who, who died and the coroner said it was air pollution which is very rarely, I don't know if it's ever appeared before on a, uh, on a death certificate. No. Uh, it's really tragic, um, but it is part of a long-term sort of raising of awareness about the absolute seriousness of these issues. Well, very much so. And uh, her mother was, uh, was very courageous because uh, 
she's a hero really. Here, the daughter dies. The daughter had severe asthma and lived in, like most poor people do, in a, a, a highly polluted area. Um, so her asthma was exacerbated by the air pollution. And on days of high air pollution, she had terrible asthma and eventually, as you say, died. And the coroner, the first time, didn't mention it. Um, but uh, the mother was a hero and said, you know, this, we've got to have a second inquest yeah. into this death. And in the second inquest, the coroner looked at all the data, uh, we supplied some of the data, and many other people joined in uh, supporting the mother. Uh, and the mother had great lawyers. And the, um, uh, the result was that the coroner came to the conclusion that it was that there was a causal connection between the air pollution and the death of the girl. And that had never been shown, you know. Uh, uh, like on, on certificates, uh, death certificates of people who smoke and die of lung disease, the death certificates don't say, uh, they died from smoking. They say they died of lung disease. So, um, so this is that level of change where the coroner is actually being willing to say she didn't just die of the asthma, but the asthma was because of the air pollution. So she died of air pollution, and that really will change uh, how air pollution gets regulated. And and of course, it's not just in the UK, and it's um, and it's not just in Europe. It's even worse in lots of other parts of the world. And people there are waking up to it too. And these cases in Europe were helpful in that regard because they got some, uh, so uh, much publicity. So lots of activists in Asia are working on it. They already were, but again, more so. Now, you won the, the famous sort of UK victories you found in the European Court of uh, Justice, um, but the UK is no longer in the EU. Um, so those, um, those judgments, do they still hold? And what happens after Brexit? I mean, do you now say, well, we don't need to, you know, we'll do our, we'll have our cases in the EU for EU countries. What mechanisms are there or will there be in the UK um, in order to pursue these sorts of lawsuits? This came up actually in our, uh, we had a, um, an episode with Angela Francis, uh, is a, a brilliant economist from uh, WWF. And we talked about at that time, there was a, it was just after the sort of final exit of the UK from the EU. Would there be a legal process in place that was robust that you could use to pursue these sorts of uh, cases and lawsuits? It's a great question. Um, now, the answer is yes, there is one. Um, and it's not too different yet from the way it was. Um, because the, the air quality law was essentially taken over. I mean, uh, the, the various EU laws were essentially taken over uh, and they weren't just EU laws. I mean, the way uh, law gets made in Europe is the UK when it was a member and all the other countries go to Brussels and then they agree on the law. Uh, so uh, what some politicians like to say is we have, uh, or we had laws ran down our throats, um, simply not true. Uh, we had no laws uh, in the UK that originated in Europe that we didn't help write uh, and that we didn't agree to. So as with the air quality law, we agreed in Brussels, it comes back and then the parliament in London passes it. So uh, Brussels didn't uh, just dictate stuff, the parliament in London passes the law. But the appeals process yeah. used to be to go up to the European Court of Justice. What is the appeals process or who do you, with that, the, the, the law might be there, but how do you apply it now? Surely mm. has changed considerably, has it not? Yes. Well, the um, the way it works is uh, it, it, again uh, as it did. So you have three levels of court in the UK. You know the trial court, the appeals court, and then the Supreme Court. Um, but now it stops at the level of the Supreme Court. So there's no European court uh, to to go to. Now that in theory could be okay. I mean, if if the if the law isn't rewritten and weakened. Uh, but remains good, uh, that will, that's number one. But there are threats that the law will be weakened. Uh, that's a serious threat, that the air pollution law will be weakened. Um, and the other thing is uh, the government has a proposal uh, underway to make it more difficult for citizens to go to court in the UK to enforce the laws when the government breaks them. So the government is looking to make it harder to partly close the courthouse doors so that people can't hold it to account, even when it's breaking its own laws. Now, that is not what you want to see in a democracy, obviously. You shouldn't be worried about getting sued by your own citizens who say, uh, look, um, you, the government, have a duty to, to everybody 
I don't make any money out of this case. I'm bringing this case on behalf of everybody. So look, look pay attention and comply with the law. You shouldn't worry about that if you're complying with the law. Um, that you only want to bring those restrictions in if you intend to break the law and want to get away with it. So, so that it's a very dangerous tendency uh, in uh, reducing access to justice. Uh, and that's going on right now. Well, so I, I wish we had our guest from episode 25. Um, the first episode this year was uh, Lord Goldsmith, Zach Goldsmith. Um, and um, hopefully, I'm, I'm trying to remember whether we discussed exactly this point um, but if we if we didn't, then maybe next time I see him, I'll I'll, sure. uh, I'll seek his views on whether that is likely to happen or not. Uh, but it does raise an an interesting point, which is that um, you're using the law and treading a path that is not what you you know the, the, the average environmental activist um, out there marching and sort of vilifying business and you know not generally not you know not using the same tactics um so is there a sort of left right divide here because i'm a conservative and i think that what you're doing is absolutely you know brilliant i can't see how any conservative could object right mm -hmm. the polluter should pay and the law should be upheld without you know without fear or favor people should you know uh, adhere to the laws so this is an entirely conservative approach in my view um, do you agree with that well, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that because I, I believe it's a conservative view. I, I believe it's a progressive view. You know, um, I, I really don't think that there, it has anything to do with politics. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you believe in a, uh, in a democratic uh, functioning society where people actually will want to see that governments uh, take care of the interests of the people, then as you say, uh, you should want good laws and you should want them to be implemented. And you know, we work with people from all spectrums of uh, political party, of, of all the parties uh, in the UK and in all other countries. Anyone who uh, wants the environment and human health to be protected. Zach is a good friend, for example. And um, uh, so uh, I see it as very much non-party political. There was a, an example in, um, in Poland where we were working to protect the last of the really great Ice Age rainforests, the uh, Bielowieski Forest. And we put together a call, we were doing the legal work. We put together uh, with others a coalition of citizens groups and uh, it was very interesting to see that the forest uh, had nothing to do with politics. People believed in the patrimony of the forest and uh, the people in the coalition, it was the broadest coalition I ever saw. On, uh, on uh, one end uh, we wanted, uh, we had people who uh, wanted to see the restoration of the monarchy and on the other end we had anarchists and uh, but they all completely agreed that we need to enforce the law to save the forest and that was quite inspiring yeah tremendous i think so they agreed that we should see the restoration of the aurochs if not the monarchy ah, yes indeed yeah <laughs> but um moving on to uh specifically or more, more directly the issue of climate yeah um i wrote something at the end of 2019 um so before the pandemic those 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 happy innocent days um and it was about all of these climate lawsuits and there's been something, you know, approaching, I think it was, hang on, I've got the number here somewhere. Uh, it was at the time, 1,380 lawsuits, also includes countersuits and so on, but 1,380 um, procedures and processes around climate. And the question I asked myself or in the, asked in the piece was, are these irritants? You know, is the net effect going to be to slow down, make more expensive the, the activities of the oil and gas and coal sector, or is there something existentially challenging? I mean, is it really possible that all of the um, disclosures from these lawsuits and the, um, the precedent set by these lawsuits actually is of existential threat to fossil fuel producers, distributors, users, et cetera? Well, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, and um, I, I think they have a, a great role to play. Um, and and uh, I, I should start by saying that there, there's a broad spectrum of what I think of as climate lawsuits. So um, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. I mean, in Poland, we've, uh, we've stopped a new generation of coal-fired power stations <clears throat> by bringing cases against those investments in, in the, uh, the coal-fired power stations. 
arguing that uh, they weren't meeting environmental permit requirements and environmental impact assessment requirements, basic um, environmental cases, but very much uh, uh, intended to uh, stop coal plants in order to get a climate benefit. Um, then uh, more recently, we've brought uh, a case which was uh, purely a finance case. So over the last five or six years, uh, we've put together a team of now 15 lawyers who are company and finance specialists. So securities lawyers, banking lawyers, insurance lawyers, uh, and so on, uh, using finance law to try and uh, uh, stop climate change by essentially, essentially moving the money away from fossil fuel investment to clean investment. Uh, and then there are many ways to do that. One of them is to sue these power plants. Another was uh, to use a shareholder case. This was an interesting first uh, in the world lawsuit that we did a couple of years ago. Uh, and we bought, again, Poland, but uh, we bought uh, uh, shares uh, in the company that was going to build what they were calling the last uh, new coal-fired power station in Europe, which was kind of a backhanded compliment to our work. Um, and, uh, uh, and then we produced an economic study with the help of a, uh, a carbon tracker, a third party, uh, who showed that this investment, purely in investment terms, uh, was a bad investment because you were investing in a stranded asset and it wasn't going to make money. Uh, it would lose money, um, even in the Polish energy market. So uh, when the company didn't buy into that, uh, we sued uh, on the basis of that analysis uh, in a straight corporate law case. And we sued the officers and directors uh, of the company personally uh, and said, you were violating your duty of care to us as shareholders. Um, and what was interesting is that the, the very conservative business newspapers in Poland uh, treated it as a very serious business case. It wasn't crazy environmentalists uh, bring case against power plant. It was investors question whether coal is any longer a good investment. Well, we won the case. And the good news was that the uh, not only did we win the case, but the next day, um, the share price of the company we'd beaten uh, went up 4%. So the market was was on our side. Uh, and this, this, to me, is a very interesting new uh, and innovative climate change case. Now, there's another group of climate change cases um, that, uh, that you'll be pointing at, which include ones that are uh, constitutional and uh, uh, potentially can have a lot of power. There was one in uh, Germany uh, just in the last couple of weeks um, <clears throat> in which a group of young people said uh, the German government wasn't doing enough um, and uh, the case was successful in the, the highest court of Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, the court, interestingly, what the court said is um, the government hadn't spelled out carefully enough how it was going to reduce its emissions. Uh, and it seemed to be uh, putting too much emphasis on waiting and waiting and doing things later, which would be unfair to future generations. Right. This is the, the 2038 shutdown of coal, which is, uh, uh, was, was deemed not fast enough. Exactly. Now, so, sim similar to the 2038 removal of the last diesel bus from the streets of London. <laughs> yes, right. Well, <laughs> uh, perhaps uh, we, we can uh, get uh, get uh, somebody in front of a German court. But um, but the uh, the value of this case is is large because uh, the uh, German government uh, immediately responded by revising its uh, climate plan. So it brought it forward to net zero in 2045 as a result. That's that's exactly right. So uh, the result of that uh, will be a substantial change uh, for fossil fuel uh, in, in Germany. Right, so you've got um, in Holland a gender that brought yep. a case, I don't know if you were involved in that, that where the young people said that Holland's not doing enough, Germany now not doing enough, um, the finance cases that you've talked about, but there is a different kind of class of cases that says that the oil and gas and coal companies um, have caused harm and are causing harm and must pay either such yeah. substantial, must either simply be shut or must pay such substantial damages that they're effectively shut. Yes. Um, do you, does, do those cases have merit or are they irritants? Well, um, you know, um, it's, it would be very so if, they, if they've broken securities law, then they'll be done under securities law. They'll pay a it's fine. But, but broadly speaking, life will continue. So I guess that's my my, my probing for whether there's something mm -hmm. kind of different about those cases. 
Well, there is in that they're, uh, uh, they're using a, a damages theory, uh, whereas the other cases, like our air quality case, we're using a theory that said uh, you need to correct your future conduct. Um, rather than to go back and pay damages for things that were done in the past. Now, uh, New York uh, City and New York State are trying a securities uh, claim, uh, and we'll, we'll see. Uh, one has failed against Exxon, but we'll see how, how they go. The, um, um, I don't think they're irritants. Um, I have no hesitation in saying that they're uh, good uh, cases. The question is whether or some of them are good cases, it depends on the case. Just, but James, just to be clear, when I say irritants, I don't mean frivolous. Mm. I just mean that they'll raise the costs and everybody will simply be more careful about what they oh, say and what they put in their disclosures and so on. So it raises the cost of doing business, but mm. but, but doesn't existentially threaten mm. the continuity of, the, of that industry. Yes, well, it, they would have to be very successful to existentially threaten the industry. Uh, you know, the, the model of them is are the, the cases that were brought in the United States quite successfully, it took 10 years but successfully uh, against tobacco companies uh, for addicting people to cigarettes, you know, and uh, misleading them. And those paid out billions in damages. Um, and uh, it, it hasn't uh, reduced uh, smoking as far as I know. What it did do was, um, I mean, it, it benefited the, uh, uh, the, the, the states who had to pay for people's healthcare. Uh, and it shifted uh, the uh, cigarette companies attention away from the US market for advertising more to third world countries. Uh, so it had impacts, but not necessarily the full suite. Right. That so right. that cigarette, the, the, with the, in the example of cigarettes, where it ended up in the US and Canada, but mainly in the US was a sort of devil's bargain. Hmm. That people would continue smoking, but uh, because that would then pay, that would then yield these big payments and their hmm. ongoing payments, which hmm. would fund healthcare. And, the, the question for climate is, well, if if the same thing happens and they're just big ongoing payments, but as long as you keep polluting and emitting, you won't get to net zero. So it's not compat That solution is not compatible with net zero, is it? Well, yes, but uh, dep depend on the judgment. So if the judgment was uh, Exxon had to pay out 100 billion uh, and the, the rest of law was moving it down, uh, that it, you, you could still close it and get, get the money out. The question is whether um, a court will go so far as to say uh, that they are liable um, because we were saying in the uh, uh, Elikasi Debra case that the coroner did say uh, her death was caused by air pollution. Now it's going to be uh, much more, uh, it's a much longer causal chain to make for a judge to say that Exxon is liable for the flooding in North Carolina or for the fires happening in southeastern Australia. Uh, the science is quite good on climate attribution now and getting better, uh, but it's nowhere near as close as it was in the- But it, but it, never, and it never will be um, because these things are statistical. There's a lot of noise in the system in weather. Uh, and um, so, you know, you could say that those fires became 20% more likely. The trouble is there can be another scientific paper next year that says, oh no, it's 28%. And then one year after says it's, it's 15%. And, and that's where the science is going to bounce around. Yes, I mean, but actually, these are chaotic systems. Just in terms, of, in terms of the science, it's not bouncing around, it's all moving in one direction. And what you're getting is that since the climate is changing, uh, events, uh, the fires, floods that were, for example, happening that were so-called once in a hundred year floods, uh, or now it's once in a thousand year floods or fires are happening not once every thousand years, but once every three years. But, so, but, but it's still statistical. And the as the granularity, I, 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 I do agree that it's moving in the sense that, you know, yeah. we're seeing the footprint or the fingerprints of climate in more and more places, yeah. but it's still only a statistical fingerprint. Well, um, that's right. But that, but that was the, also the case with, the, uh, with cigarettes, too, uh, with, with any particular death. Uh, but listen, I, uh, I don't, I'm not cigarette. putting my... No, nobody, has a, nobody has a death certificate saying this person died from smoking. That's right. They only have one that says they died from emphysema, and we know that correlates with smoking, and then they came to a big out-of-court settlement. Yes, exactly. So, um, uh, but what, what I can uh, say on, on this one is I'm not putting my time into those cases, you know. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing other, other kinds of cases myself. Oh. Yeah, no, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging not because I want a particular outcome one way or the mm -hmm. other. It's, it's in the interest only mm -hmm. of, of finding what you thought yeah. about their, 
the, no, the, I think I think that they uh, that they that there will be people who keep doing them, and they're, they're also easier to bring if you're a government. So if you are the uh, uh, the government of the state of New York, for example, and uh, New York is going to be uh, as it will, and Manhattan is quite low lying. You know, there will be as is London, as are many places, and there will be storm surges. There have already been fairly significant ones. They'll get worse and worse. So uh, if you uh, want to seek some compensation. Uh, for uh, from oil companies who do have deep pockets in order to build yourself 20 foot high seawalls, you might then bring the case. And you would also have the, um, the wherewithal to do it. Uh, you know, a small charity, no matter how clever our lawyers, uh, doesn't have the resources to bring such a case uh, against Exxon. But governments will and do, and there are a number of um, uh, uh, governments in California that have brought similar cases. And, you know, many of them will fail. But I think at a certain point, I'm a judge is going to say, well, look, the connection is so obvious, you know, that, uh, that I'm going to give you, yes, in New York, you're not claiming for all of the money of Exxon. You, you need uh, 100 million to build seawalls. You know, I, I can see that's reasonable. So I think that will happen one day. Um, yeah, and I think, and without sort of without pointing at my sources, because I work and I talk to lots of people across, all, you know, all industries, including the extractive industries and oil and gas and, mm -hmm. and even coal, and I, I can tell you that there is concern. It does definitely increase the cost of capital. It does increase mm -hmm. the difficulty of doing business, and there is real discussion about that um, because there's this kind of lattice of cases, and it's kind of like, well, we have to claim that we didn't know about something in that case, but then in that case, we have to claim that we were being diligent vis-a-vis -vis our investors. So we have to explain that we did know about it and we did take yeah. it into account. Yeah. And then of course, you can't say anything that's inconsistent. So there no, is no, terror right. in all of this for no. those companies. No, that's, that's very interesting, yeah. And so one, one, one just should uh, recommend uh, moving the assets into renewable energy, I think. Well, <laughs> Seriously, I, you know, uh, I, I, not, sticking, not sticking in that matrix, you know. And I do believe that that's one of the drivers for particularly the European oil and gas companies doing exactly mm -hmm. that. Yes. I want to just, uh, I promised that we'd get back to China. Yes. Um, because you mentioned that you have these uh, agreements with the Supreme Court, uh, the Court of uh, Environmental, I, 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 you're going to have to repeat yes. who you have yes. agreements so with. The, uh, uh, the Supreme Court and the Federal Prosecutors and Ministry of Environment. Uh, yeah. uh, well, why would you have agreements with them? I mean, shouldn't you have agreements with people trying to hold them to account. There are strong environmental laws in China that are mm. routinely ignored by the well-connected, are they not? Well, I mean, that's really why we're there. So uh, the, the remarkable thing was um, I got uh, called in about seven years ago where I got invited to a meeting in Beijing uh, to meet a group of Supreme Court judges. And then uh, the guy who was head of the Environment Committee in the, uh, in the Congress and the number two person at the Ministry of Environment. And uh, the reason is they wanted advice on a law that they were drafting uh, to give Chinese uh, environmental groups the right to sue polluting companies, um, including those owned by the government. Uh, and they said, we've done our research, as the Chinese do, uh, and uh, you know, you're the only guy who's brought these cases in both Europe and the United States. Uh, so you must know what it takes to make a system work. We're keen on making our system work. You tell us how we need to design it so Chinese NGOs can win these cases. And I said, very happily, you know, uh, there, are, there are six elements, we'll get to them in a minute. But first, I just wanna say how remarkable it is, I think, that uh, China is bringing in a law to allow uh, Chinese NGOs to sue state-owned companies who are polluting. You know, uh, this, is, this is revolutionary. And the senior judge said, hmm, Mr. Thornton, uh, revolutionary is a big word for us. Uh, and, and it was wonderful because, you know, we had a human connection straight away. Um, and I said, this, okay, we laughed. And then, and I said, but why are you doing it? Um, you know, what's, what's, what's behind this, you know? And before I get into how you do it, why? And I said, well, it's really clear. I mean, we, um, we need to uh, bring a very high level of uh, enforcement to, uh, to China in terms of um, air pollution, water pollution, uh, the soil is polluted, the food is polluted. Uh, we have the biggest carbon emission uh, in, in the world. All of that has to change very rapidly. And they said, uh, you know, we're very aware of this and it's an unintended consequence of something that we were doing uh, that was good. We wanted to bring the largest number of people from, up from poverty in history. 
Um, and we succeeded in doing that. Um, we've brought something like 450 million people up from poverty in the last 50 years. And we didn't realize that we were trashing the environment. It was stupid, but we didn't. And now that we see it, uh, we're doing it. We have to move rapidly uh, to do something about it, partly because uh, uh, it needs to be done, partly because we have a very long horizon. And our job today is to make sure that there'll be healthy people here in 2000 years, um, like there were people right. here 2000 years ago. But also partly because they were coming under significant civic pressure. I mean, it's yes, not indeed. we hear about all the time, but they have, they have actual demonstrations. And, it, and it's very interesting because you also see that in a place like Turkey, that, you know, there is, uh, you know, there are demonstrations about, uh, you know, most recently, I actually got um, inadvertently tear gassed in Istanbul. Uh, once, but the but the reason that there was had been a riot, it was actually a hang a holdover from the I think, I think it was the day before, but there was still it was still very powerful in the air, um, and that was because uh, of the decision to destroy a park. So environment right. matters to people; it does get them out on the streets. But um, how many times has that Chinese law been used by Chinese NGOs to sue state-owned corporations or? either regional or, or central government. Mm, yeah, so, well, it's being used by um, by the, oh, and by the way, they were very clear uh, on that. So I, I got through my first two reasons. Reason number three oh, okay. that they said, no, quite all right, it was exactly what you said. They said, look, and the third reason is that the people are so concerned about this uh, that uh, if we don't do something quickly and are seen to be doing it and doing and really successful at it, harmony may break down. And then I, I went to a Chinese scholar and said, what does harmony breaking down mean? And they said, well, it's broken down in the last 2,500 years. Harmony is broken down like four or five times. And then millions die. Uh, there's chaos until the center reasserts itself. So that's how serious they're taking this. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, right. And so, so how, how many times have you? So, uh, so uh, it does two things. One, it allows NGOs to bring cases. And there, there have been... Uh, uh, I don't know the full number. Uh, there have been, last I knew, well over 100 cases brought uh, by Chinese NGOs. Now, that's big, uh, since there aren't that many Chinese environmental NGOs, and they're not well, that well funded. We've been working to get, uh, um, successfully working to get um, Western money into them uh, to help them bring cases. Um, but very impressive is that the same law allowed Chinese pros allows Chinese prosecutors to uh, sue government agencies as well as companies. Um, uh, when the government agencies aren't doing their job. And, uh, and then the Chinese uh, set up a system of environmental courts, 3,000 environment court judges, unlike anything else in the world, so that they could start hearing a lot of cases because as you said, good laws, not well enforced. 3,000 judges, amazing. And uh, then I went back a few months later and um, after our, my first meetings there, and the, uh, the Supreme Court judges asked me to train judges um, because, uh, you know, in our discussion, I was saying, you know, these judges need training. Uh, and and your, but your Beijing office, which you mentioned at the beginning, is that generally working with the government or working with those NGOs or the prosecutors? But, but, but much of the work you do is with, is with the government. But, but here's why. I mean, so uh, there's tremendous, so here we have a government which in the West, uh, understandably, is seen in a certain way and in a very negative way. I fully understand it. But the story that doesn't get out is they really are working incredibly hard on the environment. And so what I want to do is to speed up their progress uh, in that. And one of the ways is by working with the NGOs and one of the ways is by working with the government. So uh, uh, 3000 environment court judges. And then the opportunity was, will you train them uh, to decide cases? An astounding, offer to a foreign NGO. So we brought in lots of experts from around the world, training the judges. And then the prosecutors um, uh, came to us about a year later, federal prosecutors, and said, in that law that you helped work on, uh, you know, we got the right to sue the government agencies when they're not doing their job, but we've never had the right to sue the government before. Would you train us to sue the Chinese government? So here you have the Chinese prosecutors saying, can you train us to sue the Chinese government? Amazing. So of course we said yes. And, and then here are some statistics. So um, the, uh, uh, about a month or so ago, we got a letter from the prosecutors saying, uh, you know, thank you for all the work we've done together now over the last four years. You brought the whole methodology of uh, environmental prosecution uh, in the public interest to China. 
in the last year, we have initiated 80,000 cases. Um, and in the prior three years, they'd initiated around 200, so uh, thousand. So here we have like a quarter of a million cases and more initiated uh, by the prosecutors. Uh, and I'm very, proud, very, very proud to be part of that uh, because the leverage is enormous. Uh, and then about 70% of these are against government entities who aren't doing their job. Remarkable. But, but it, it, this is absolutely fascinating because of course, what, you know, behind my questions, I'm probing to see whether, you know, whether the, um, I was gonna say the poacher has turned gamekeeper or if a gamekeeper has turned poacher because, you know, you could argue that that is, you know, you've, you've probably, you know, improved the environment and done great work, but, but that's just um, helping to develop the sinews of government if it's not, if they're not being held to account, because it's still government deciding who to sue and it's government pr prosecuting those cases and then deciding whether they, whether even those findings, those outcomes are enforced. So you have you not lost the fundamental core of what client earth and what, you know, NRDC, um, so and, and uh, yeah, NRDC, you know, sort of started with, which is holding, speaking truth to power, holding the powerful to account, not helping the powerful to become slightly more efficient. Well, listen, I mean, uh, it, is, it is an astounding thing that the prosecutors want to bring tens of thousands of cases against, uh, against officials who aren't enforcing environmental laws. Um, the rapidity with which you can then uh, achieve change is very dramatic. So no, I don't think I'm going against my, my principles. In fact, I think I found the most efficient way of operating. If I could, if I could get the UK government and the US government uh, to work with me in the same way, uh, things would be much better uh, in those countries, you know, uh, because they're taking the expertise and actually applying it uh, in the right way. Now, are we also working with NGOs? Sure, of course, uh, but uh, NGOs can't bring um, hundreds of thousands of cases. It's just not possible. Right. Very good. Well, it's been a tremendous pleasure uh, talking to you today and learning a bit more about uh, you know, what, what you do, how you do it, and even why you do it and where you do it. <laughs> so uh, it just remains to me really to, to thank you for your time and for explaining it to us. Well, thank you, Michael. It's, it's a real pleasure. And I appreciate the depth of your questions. Very good. Very good. And um, I, I wish you uh, good luck um, imposing, or um, I don't know what I would say, but yeah, it's imposing the rule of law. As I say, this is just about uh, the polluter pays and having the laws and then uh, making sure they're enforced. Mm -hmm. okay. Very good. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> so that was James Thornton, CEO and founder of Client Earth. My guest next week is Catherine McKenna. She's the former Minister of Environment and Climate Change for Canada now Minister for Infrastructure and Communities. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Catherine McKenna.